Hello, and thank you for your interest in our six-year medicine course here at Oxford. My name's Chris Norbury. I'm a scientist based in the university at the Dunn School of Pathology. I'm also currently the academic with overall responsibility for admissions to the medical school, as well as being one of the tutors at Queen's College. Well, we think this is a pretty good course, but we would say that, wouldn't we? Um, so you might want to look for opinion from elsewhere. So you can go online and look at various rankings. And depending on which ranking you choose, you'll find that we are ranked for medicine uh, either uh, second best in the world here, or if you choose a different ranking system using slightly different criteria, uh, top of the list. So that's very good for our collective egos, but more importantly, our own students tell us at the end of their six years that not only, only have they had a, a, an enjoyable time and a satisfying experience, uh, but that they also feel particularly well prepared for their careers in medicine in comparison with graduates from other UK medical schools. Before going any further, it's, it's important to stress the nature of, of this course overall. So it's, it's what's sometimes termed a, a traditional course. In other words, there's a very strong emphasis on science in the first half of the course, in the first three years, uh, where there's comparatively little patient contact in comparison with, with other UK medical schools. And then in years four to six, uh, it's pure clinical training based at the John Radcliffe Hospital here in Oxford and other uh, nearby hospitals. Uh, with comparatively little exposure to basic science. So it's a course of two halves with very little patient contact in the first half. So it's worth thinking quite deeply about whether or not that course structure is one that's attractive to you. Uh, we think it works because by the time uh, you've spent three years studying the science, you can really understand uh, the clinical uh, content in years four to six, but other medical schools uh, take a different approach that might be more suited to your, to your particular needs. If you want further details of the course, you'll find them all online here. And uh, what you'll find is that not only is there strong emphasis on science in the first three years, but quite a lot of the teaching delivery is by active scientists. And, and just going back briefly to that university ranking that we started out with, uh, quite a lot of the weighting there is given to the quality of the research. So this is a, a science-based research-intensive uh, degree in medicine uh, by comparison with, with other courses that you might be looking at. The principal purpose of this session is just to outline how the application process works. And uh, this slide just gives you that process at, at a glance. Uh, so one way in which we differ from other medical schools is at the shortlisting stage. We shortlist quite stringently. Uh, so we might look at interview at only about 20 to 25% of our applicants. And so we pay quite a lot of attention to that shortlisting process. And the shortlisting measures that we use uh, include the admissions test, which for us, us is the BMAT test, more of which in a moment. And for those candidates who have GCSE grades, uh, we'll take those into account uh, in, in this stage of, of the process uh, in the context of their own school where they took their GCSEs, and that's about two-thirds of our applicants have GCSEs. And we'll, of course, look at any other relevant information that forms part of the UCAS application form. So after shortlisting, we're then going to invite shortlisted candidates to interview, and those interviews this year, uh, as they were last year, will be online interviews. But each shortlisted candidate will be interviewed by two colleges, and those interviews will address a, a set of selection criteria that I'll come on to in just a moment. At the completion of interviews, each of the interviewing colleges is going to rank all of the candidates they've seen, and uh, in short, uh, the offers will go to those who are towards the top of that final ranking. These are the numbers from the last admissions round in December of last year. So you'll see we had just over 2,000 applicants for 157 places. And that works out about 13 applicants per place. And we interviewed uh, about 430 of those. So uh, these headline numbers can look a little bit scary, uh, but uh, they're actually not so different from the ratio of applicants to places that you'll find at other UK medical schools. And the reality is that uh, the course uh, is quite well regarded and very popular, uh, as you can see, uh, but we're still quite a small medical school, so that the number of places that we have on offer here accounts for only about 2% of all UK medical school places. Uh, so if you like the look of the course and you put in an application uh, and it doesn't work out, then that's no reflection on you as a candidate. It's just that we don't have uh, enough places uh, to offer a place to, to all of the well-qualified candidates who do apply. Most of our applicants will be studying towards A-level qualifications, and for those applicants, our standard conditional offer 
uh, will be A star AA, and that has to include chemistry and one from biology, maths, and physics. And we ask you to achieve those grades at a single sitting. The rationale for that is that if you can operate at that level in academic terms, uh, you're likely to be able to cope with the academic intensity of the first three years of the course here. Importantly, we don't have any particular preference for individual subject combinations beyond those that I've just described. So, for example, we don't have a, a preference for candidates who are studying maths uh, rather than physics, and we don't have a preference for candidates who are studying three sciences uh, rather than, for example, two sciences and a humanities subject, and uh, we don't have a preference for candidates who are studying more than three A-levels. In fact, uh, those who are studying more than three are at no a particular advantage over those who are studying three subjects. If you're studying towards IB or Scottish qualifications or any other alternatives to A-levels, then you'll find the equivalent to our, our standard A star AA offer online at this address here. So this slide is perhaps the single most important one. It lists our 11 selection criteria, and you'll see that uh, they're split into two lists. On the left-hand side here, we have the academic criteria, uh, and they include uh, compat compatibility with small group teaching. One of our unique selling points is the strong emphasis on small group uh, teaching in the first three years of the course, and so we're trying to identify applicants who stand to benefit most from that style of learning. And just as important as these three academic criteria are the eight criteria on the right-hand side which relate to suitability for medicine, and they include things like empathy and ethical awareness and alignment with the values of the NHS constitution, and we take these very seriously during the application process. One of the things that you may notice is, is not on this list on the right hand side is work experience. So we don't, we don't have any particular uh, requirement for a particular type of work experience. And we do realise how difficult it is to get work experience in a clinical uh, setting, for example. Uh, but it may be that there are other experiences that you have in your life that allow you to, to match the selection criteria listed here. Uh, without any particular requirement to have had any particular type of work experience. As scientists and clinician scientists, we're always interested in the evidence base for our decisions. And uh, in this case, the evidence for our admissions decisions can come from a variety of sources. And in this slide, the, the bold type items are a little bit more important than those in, in uh, plain text. On the academic side, we can extract useful evidence from the application form, in particular in relation to uh, GCSE performance, which we know uh, to some extent predicts performance on our course here. We have the admissions test, uh, which uh, also addresses uh, GCSE level science knowledge, as well as uh, scientific reasoning and language skills. And uh, we have the interviews, which might include some uh, component of academic um, questioning. And then on, on the suitability for medicine side, uh, we can look for evidence in the personal statement to some degree, uh, and we'll ask questions at interview that relate to suitability for medicine. And other aspects of the application can be important, but uh, are likely to be less uh, important overall. Uh, for example, the extended project, which uh, some of our candidates have and some don't, um, can add weight to, to the application, uh, but it's not something that we're going to use in a quantitative way uh, during the shortlisting process, for example. So a little bit more about the personal statement. Um, the most important advice I can offer you here is really to be as honest as you can. Uh, we're very interested to know who you are as a person, and uh, so don't try to, to pretend to be somebody else. Remember, one of our selection criteria is honesty, after all. So please, in a, in a straightforward and honest, honest way, just tell us why you're interested in studying medicine, if you can, tell us how you've managed to reach an informed decision about entering into a career in medicine and the steps you've taken uh, towards that informed decision. And if you can, uh, think about our list of selection criteria and think quite broadly about all the things you've done uh, that might relate to those selection criteria. For example, your capacity for sustained intense uh, work. Is there something you've done that, that demonstrates that capacity? in the past. If there is, please tell us about it in the personal statement. Uh, if you're planning to take a gap year in between school and, and university, then this would be a good place uh, to, to tell us why you're planning to do that and how that adds weight to uh, 
uh, your application. Moving on to the admissions test, which for us, remember, is the BMAT. Uh, this is a two-hour test uh, consisting of three parts. It's a 60-minute test of aptitude and skills, followed by a 30-minute test of GCSE level scientific knowledge, and then uh, a short writing task uh, in the final 30 minutes. The BMAT is designed to be as resistant as possible to coaching effects, and the only preparation you really need is GCSE level knowledge of science and maths, and familiarity with the test itself and the format in which the papers are, are set out. And I'll explain in a moment how you can find those details. So the dates for this year are not yet set in stone, but the, the registration deadline will be at some point in October with the test itself in early November. So you could check uh, the BMAT website here for uh, updates on that information. And on that website, you'll find not only details about the BMAT November session, which is the one that you're looking for here, uh, but also a video explaining the test and, importantly, a whole variety of past papers that you can download and have a, get, have a go at in your own time. And uh, as they point out on their website here, there's no need to pay for anything beyond uh, what's available on the website here. Uh, they provide everything uh, for you uh, to prepare for the test. And I like to take the BMAT myself every year just to share the experience. And uh, it's always impressive just how difficult it is and it's, of course, designed to be quite a difficult test uh, because we're trying to, to, to um, discriminate usefully among a set of applicants who are all pretty good in academic terms. So once you feel ready, download some past papers and have a go under self-imposed time conditions. And that's really the best preparation you can have uh, for the test itself. So because all of our applicants will have taken the BMAT, we're going to use the BMAT score as part of the shortlisting process. Uh, if you've also been awarded GCSE grades, uh, then uh, we'll take those into consideration too in relation to the grades that were awarded to all the students at your school. And because we're using for most applicants a combination of GCSE grades and the admissions test score, that necessarily means there is no threshold uh, sort of pass mark uh, for the admissions test uh, or no particular number of, of GC GCSE grades at eight or nine. Uh, that are required to obtain an interview. It's a combination of the two. But nonetheless, it's quite useful perhaps for you to look back uh, at the data from last year. And so this uh, is the distribution of admissions test scores from last year. And uh, you can see that it's, it's a, a, a fairly normal distribution um, with most candidates getting something in the range of, of 50 to 60 percent in this test. I told you it was quite difficult and uh, almost nobody getting uh, close to 100%. And the, the, the bars are colour-coded here so that um, those candidates who uh, were successful in being offered a place are shaded in grey. Uh, those who were interviewed, in other words, shortlisted, uh, but uh, were not offered a place are in orange and everyone else is in blue. And you can see that the distribution is pretty much as you'd expect it to be. And you'll see that last year, uh, nobody who scored uh, less than 50% in the admissions test uh, received an offer, just as a rough guide uh, for the sort of uh, range of marks uh, that are associated with, with uh, success in the process overall. And on our website, you'll also find uh, data from last year in relation to uh, GCSE grades that you might find useful to, to look through too. So the shortlisting takes place in two stages. In the first stage, a computer algorithm uses a combination of the admissions test score and GCSE grades for those who have them uh, to draw up an initial shortlist. And then we look through uh, the applications of all those who are not yet on that list and identify another 40 or so candidates who deserve to be added to the shortlist uh, because they've been disadvantaged in some way uh, by the algorithm. All short shortlisted applicants will then be interviewed at two colleges. And if you express a preference for a particular college in your application, then it's likely that that will be one of the two colleges. And then everyone's allocated to a second college um, by a computer. Importantly, at the time of interview, uh, those who are interviewing you uh, won't be aware of any college preference you may have expressed, and they won't know how well you've done in the admissions test. And the reason, reason for that is that we like to keep the interview process as independent as possible from the other aspects of your application. The order of the interviews will also be randomised, so that the people who are interviewing you uh, don't know uh, whether you've applied to their college or not. And because the interview process is, is entirely independent of college choice, 
uh, it's quite often the case that offers are made uh, by colleges that were not the first choice college uh, for a particular applicant. And so um, that helps us to ensure that overall the chances of success are not influenced by college choice. As for the interviews themselves, they're going to be con conducted remotely via Microsoft Teams in early December. And the questions that are raised at interview will address those explicit selection criteria I referred to earlier on. And although the precise arrangements for interviews vary a little bit from college to college, it's quite common for each interviewing college to interview each candidate twice, meaning that for any given candidate, there might be up to a total of four interviews over the space of a couple of days. The people who are interviewing you will be, uh, in general, a mixture of clinicians and scientists, and each candidate will be interviewed by at least one practicing clinician. In some colleges, those interview panels are arranged so that there's a separate clinical interview and a scientific interview. In others, the clinicians and scientists will, will be mixed together uh, on the interview panel. And it's at this point that what you've written in your personal statement might come back into the frame. So it's important that you're uh, prepared to talk about anything you've written in your personal statement. It can quite often form the basis for a warm-up question at the beginning of the interview, for example. Once all the interviews are complete, each college will rank all of the candidates they've seen on the basis of interview performance and the content of the UCAS application form. And only after that will the college receive the new information of the admissions test score and the candidates rank score from the other interviewing college. So then the colleges will, will adjust their ranking and it's that final ranking that will be used to determine uh, who receives offers of places. And in the event that two colleges would like to make an offer to a particular candidate, uh, it's the College of Application uh, that has the first choice over that candidate. So I hope that's explained our admissions process to you. If you find you have further questions, it's likely they'll be answered by uh, consulting our Frequently Asked Questions list on the website uh, shown here. And you'll find a lot of additional information there about the structure of the course uh, and so on. If you still find you have questions, feel free to email uh, this address here, the admissions address, uh, or, or direct them to our Twitter account. Thanks very much for your time, and good luck with your applications. Bye now.